Welcome back to Rockford Reading Daily. We are beginning chapter three of Evicted, which is entitled Hot Water. Lenny Lawson stepped out of his trailer park office to burn a Paul Mall. Smoke drifted up past his mustache and light blue eyes and disappeared above a baseball cap. He looked out over the rows of mobile homes bunched together on a skinny strip of asphalt. Almost all the trailers were lined up in the same direction and set a couple of steps apart. The airport was closed, and even longtime residents looked up when planes came in low, exposing their underbellies and rattling the windows. Lenny had spent his entire life in this place, all 43 years of it, and for the past dozen years, he had worked as its manager. Lenny knew the druggies lived mostly on the north side of the trailer park, and the people working double shifts at restaurants or nursing homes live mostly on the south side. The metal scrappers and can collectors live near the entrance and the people with the best jobs, sandblasters, mechanics, congregated on the park's snobby side, behind the office, in mobile homes with freshly swept porches and flower pots. Those on SSI were sprinkled throughout, as were the older folks who, quote, went to bed with the chickens and woke up with the chickens, end quote, as some park residents like to say. Lenny tried to house the sex offenders near the druggies, but it didn't always work out. He had to he had had to place one near the double shifters. Thankfully, the man never left his trailer or even opened the blinds. Someone delivered food and other necessities to him every week. College Mobile Home Park sat on the far south side of the city on 6th Street off College Avenue. It was bordered on one side by overgrown trees, shrubs, and sand pits, and, on the other, by a large truck distribution center. It was a 15-minute walk to the nearest gas station or fast food restaurant. There were other trailer parks nearby, surrounded by streets with modest, tawny brick homes and sharply pitched roofs. This was the part of Milwaukee where poor white folks lived. The Minamanee River Valley cuts through the middle of the city and functions like its Mason-Dixon line, dividing the predominantly black north side from the predominantly white south side. Milwaukeeans used to joke that the 16th Street 16th Street Viaduct, which stretches over the valley, was the longest bridge in the world because it connected Africa to Poland. The biggest efforts to change that came in 1967 when 200 demonstrators, almost all of them black, gathered at the north end of the viaduct and began walking to Poland to protest housing discrimination. As the marchers approached the south side of the bridge, they heard the crowd before they saw it. Chants of, quote, kill, kill, end quote, and, quote, we want slaves, end quote, rose up above the rock and roll music blasted from loudspeakers. Then the crowd appeared, a deep swell of white faces, upwards of 13,000 by some counts. Onlookers hurled bottles, rocks, piss, and spit down on the marchers. The black demonstrators marched. The white mob pulsed and seethed, and then something released, some invisible barrier fell, and the white onlookers lurched forward, crashing down on the marchers. That's when the police fired the tear gas. The marchers returned the next night and the night after that. They walked the 16th Street Viaduct for 200 consecutive nights. The city, then the nation, then the world took notice. Little changed. A 1967 New York Times editorial declared Milwaukee, quote, America's most segregated city. End quote. A supermajority in both houses had helped President Johnson pass the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, but legislators backed by real estate lobbies refused to get behind his open housing law, which would have criminalized housing discrimination. It took Martin Luther King Jr. being murdered on a Memphis balcony and the riots that ensued for Congress to include a real open house housing measure later that year in the 1968 Civil Rights Act, commonly called the Fair Housing Act. The white, working-class South Side had, since the 1930s, made room for a small number of Hispanic families whose men had been recruited to work in the tanneries. In the 1970s, the Hispanic population began to grow. Instead of putting up another fight, whites began moving out, pushing farther south and west. Poland became Mexico, 
a small enclave on the near south side of the city. The north side remained black. The east and west sides of the city, as well as the far south, where Lenny's trailer park sat, belonged to the whites. Open housing law or not, Milwaukee will remain one of the most racially divided cities in the nation. Lenny stamped out his cigarette and ducked back into the office, which was situated in the middle of the trailer park, near its only entrance and exit. It was a cramped and windowless space, paper cluttered and lit by a naked bulb screwed into the ceiling. The old fax machine, calculator, and computer were covered with grease smudges. In the summer, a wet spot grew on the thin maroon carpet under the leaky air conditioning unit. In the winter, a space heater buzzed softly on a plastic bucket. Over the years, Lenny had added some flourishes, stag antlers, a papsed blue ribbon plaque, a poster of a flush pheasant. Quote, hey, end quote, Lenny greeted Susie as he took a seat behind his desk. Susie Dunn was on her feet, as usual, sorting mail into the mailboxes that made up one side of the office. She was not placing letters in their boxes as much as punching them in there, fast and hard. It was her way. When Susie smoked, she sucked the cigarette down, keeping her hand close to her mouth. She couldn't talk without also sweeping or scrubbing or rearranging patio furniture. It was as if she'd fall over, like a toy top, if she stopped spinning. Susie's husband liked to call her the queen of the trailer park. Other people settled for office Susie, so as not to confuse her with heroin Susie. Quote, here's your unemployment check, end quote, Susie said to a letter. Quote, now why don't you pay some rent? If she don't pay her rent, she ain't going to be living here much longer. She can move back to the south side or live in the ghetto, end quote. The office door opened and in walked Mrs. Mites, barefoot. At 71, she was a tall and unfrail woman with a shock of cotton white hair, a face crisscrossed with wrinkles and no teeth. Quote, hey, granny, end quote, Lenny said with a smile. He, like everyone else in the park, thought Mrs. Mites was crazy. Quote, guess what I did today? I threw a bill in the garbage can. End quote. Mrs. Mites looked at him sidelong with her bunched up face. She had almost yelled the words. Quote, hmm, is that right? End quote. Lenny answered, looking at her. Quote, I'm no dummy. End quote. Hmm, what? Excuse me. Quote, hmm, well, I've got some bills for you. You can pay mine. End quote. Quote, ha. End quote. Mrs. Mites said walking out to start her day by pushing a grocery cart and collecting cans. Mrs. Mites paid the bills with her SSI check. She cashed in the cans to give her mentally challenged adult daughter snack money or, after a nice haul, a trip to Chuck E. Cheese's. Lenny grinned and went back to his paperwork until the door swung open again. People who got half an ear everywhere else got a full one from Lenny. It was up to him to keep track of rents and maintenance requests, to screen tenants and deliver eviction notices but it was also up to him to listen to the trailer park, to know it, know who was current and who was behind, who was pregnant, who was mixing their methadone with Xanax, whose boyfriend had just been released. Quote, sometimes I'm a shrink, end quote, he liked to say. Quote, sometimes I'm the village asshole, end quote. And then that brings us to a changing of the theme within this chapter. So let's have a small reflection. So I think what stands out immediately for me is the statement that is given that Milwaukee is the most segregated city in the USA. And I find that to be a very enlightening statement because it's been said about so many different cities at so many different time periods in this country's history. And I, I find that you can go to almost any city in in this country and you can ask, figure out, you know, ask to figure out where the black side of town is, where the white side of town is, where the rich side of town is, where the poor side of town is, uh, where the uh, Latino or Hispanic side of town may be. And, and all of these things are, uh, all of these things are in, happen in such a pattern that they cannot be coincidental or accidental. It's not a coincidence that in Rockford, Saint in Rockford, the west side of the city is considered the black side of the city. The south side of the city is uh, considered the Mexican side of the city. The 
uh, east side of the city is considered the white side of the city. You know, these these things are not cool. Don't, didn't happen by coincidence. These things happen because uh, when you trace back America's history, there were only certain parts of cities that certain ethnic ethnic groups and certain races were allowed to live in. And as time passes, those those lines become a little bit more blurred. But for the most part, they that structure stays intact and that mind state that led to that happening stays intact. And so we uh, begin as we get deeper into this book, we get begin to see more of the color line that exists in Milwaukee. And I think that that is something that we have to be very cognizant and conscious of no matter where we live at, understanding what the color line looks like and how it, what the color, color line experience is like in, in whatever city that you may be living in, whatever state you may be living in. Also, the seeing the demonstrations that took place that black people engaged in in an effort to try to be able to live in different parts of the city, be able to have fair housing and uh, fair opportunities at housing in different parts of the city. Uh, we see the demonstration that they put on for that, and we see the what, what they were met with, that they were met with violence and trying to do something as, uh, and, and struggling for something as humane as housing we see that they that these black people were met with violence in the story that they recounted about when the black people marched to the other side of town. And I think that those are all things that are very important for us to, to put into context that this, that it, again, that these things don't happen coincidentally and that these things are fought to be maintained, that people, the same way people fight to maintain mass incarceration, fight to maintain police terrorism, people fought to maintain uh, segregation in housing, people fought to maintain segregation in education, people fought to maintain uh, black people not being able to have the right to vote, people fought to maintain black people being enslaved. And when you understand how that how these fights have happened throughout time. You understand the importance of people fighting on the opposite side of those things, people fighting for uh, what's right in these circumstances. So you need people fighting for uh, equitable education and equal education, for equitable housing and equal house housing. Uh, so those are all the things that stand out to me as well. Uh, also, as we're reading this, it, it makes sure that they point out the difference that there's differences even between the rich white and the poor white. Uh, and I think that that's something for us to always keep in mind when we're speaking about these struggles is that there are poor white people who deal with some of the same pitfalls that poor black people deal with. And there are rich black people who buy into some, some of the same false ideologies that rich white people buy into. And so as much as we have to look at these things the way uh, the lens of race, we must also learn how to look through them through the lens of class and uh, through the lens of, of poverty. Okay, let's continue reading. The owner of the trailer park was named Tobin Sharney. He lived 70 miles away in Skokie, Illinois, but visited the trailer park every day except Sunday. He paid Office Susie $5 an hour and reduced the rent to $440. Tobin waived Lenny's rent and paid him a salary of $36,000 a year in cash. Tobin had a reputation for being flexible and understanding, but no one thought him a pushover. A hard man with squinting eyes and an unsmiling face, he had a gruff, hurried way about him. He was 71, the same age as Mrs. Mites, and worked out regularly, keeping a gym bag in the trunk of his Cadillac. He was not chummy with his tenants or amused by them. He did not pause to ruffle their children's hair. He did not pretend he was anything he was not. His father had been a landlord and at one point owned almost 600 units. All Tobin desired was one address and 131 trailers. But in the final week of May 2008, he found himself on the verge of losing them. All five members of Milwaukee's Licenses Committee had refused to renew Tobin's license to operate the trailer park. Alderman Terry Witowski, a longtime Southsider with a pinkish face and silver hair, was leading the charge. Witowski pointed to the 70 code violations that neighborhood services had documented in the past two years. He brought up the 260 police calls made from the trailer park in the previous year alone. 
He said the park was a haven for drugs, prostitution, and violence. He observed that an unconnected plumbing system had recently caused raw sewage to bubble up and spread under 10 mobile homes. The licenses committee now considered the trailer park, quote, an environmental biohazard, end quote. On June 10th, the city council, called the, quote, common council, end quote, in Milwaukee, would vote. If the licenses committee's decision stood, Tobin would be out of a job and his tenants would be out of a home. That's when the news people showed up with the jailed hair and shoulder-mounted cameras that looked like weapons. They interviewed residents, including some outspoken critics of Tobin. Quote, the media paints us as ignorant half-breeds, end quote, Mary was saying to Tina outside her trailer. Quote, they said this was the shame of the South Side, end quote, Tina replied. Both women had been in the park for years, and both had strong, windblown faces. Quote, my son hasn't slept because of this, end quote, Mary went on. Quote, neither have I or my husband. You know, I work two jobs. I work hard. I mean, I can't afford to go anywhere else, end quote. Mrs. Mikes walked up and put her face right up next to Tina's. Tina took a step back. Quote, that son of a bitch, end quote, Mrs. Mikes began. Quote, I'm going to call the alderman and I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. That son, end quote, quote, see, but that won't help, end quote, Tina cut in. Quote, I'm going to go and I'm going to give that alderman a piece of my mind, end quote, Mrs. Mice replied. Quote, that little son of a bitch, end quote. Tina and Mary shook their heads as Mrs. Mike stumped off. Then Mary turned serious. Quote, and to be told to move to the north side is not funny, end quote, she said. Quote, it's not funny, end quote. She looked a little and broke eye contact to keep from crying. She shook a little, excuse me, and broke eye contact to keep from crying. That was the heart of it. What trailer park residents feared the most. When Mary and Tina and Mrs. Mites and the whole trailer park talked about having to leave, what they were talking about was the possibility of having to move into the black ghetto. Office Susie was one of several residents who had previously lived on the north side where her adult son had a gun stuck in his face. Quote, the alderman said this is a ghetto slum, end quote, she vented. Quote, I'll show you a ghetto, end quote. The situation twisted Susie's stomach so much that her son hit her pain pills, fearing she'd swallow a handful. The trailer park had 10 days before the final vote. So tenants hosted a barbecue for the media, began calling local representatives, and started to recite what they would say to the common council. Rufus the junk collector, with his trim red beard and distant blue eyes, wrote up his comments and practiced. Quote, and then I'll say, who has been behind on their rent? $500. And the hands will go up. And I could keep going. $700, $1,000, and all the hands will go up. End quote. Rufus planned to end his speech by saying, quote, this is no slumlord. This is not a bad man, end quote. If his speech didn't work and the trailer park was closed, Rufus was planning to put a reciprocating saw to the trailers and sell the aluminum. And that brings us to a changing of the passage or a changing of the theme within this chapter. So here, let's have another small reflection. And I think what's the most enlightening piece about what we just read there is this fear of these people who live in this trailer park of having to move to the north side where the black people live. And this is a this is a racialized fear because from what is being a, alleged about this trailer park, they have some of the same type of problems that exist in the north side where the black black ghetto is at. The biggest difference, though, is that it's black people who live there. Uh, and that's something that you find a lot is that you can have two groups of people who are in poverty and if one of the groups that's in poverty is black, it's looked as it looked at as if the black poverty is uh, worse or more violent or more dangerous than the white poverty is. And that is just another form of divide and conquer, another form of, uh, of a way to keep people who are working class and poor people fighting amongst each other instead of paying attention to the people who are uh, perpetuating 
poverty in black and white neighborhoods who are profiting off of poverty in black and white neighborhoods. And so I just think that that is why we can, it's not just as simple as being educated on uh, the race issues. It's also about the importance of being educated on, on class issues and gender issues as well. And, and the intersections that exist within these struggles that we're waging. Okay, let's try to finish this episode up. Tobin worked with his tenants. He let them pay here and there. When tenants lost their job, he let some of them work off the rent. He would sometimes tell Lenny, quote, they may be slow paying, but they're good people, end quote. He lent a woman money to attend her mother's funeral. When the police picked up the drunks responsible for cutting grass and collecting litter in the trailer park, Tobin bailed them out of jail. Tobin's negotiations with tenants were rarely committed to writing, and sometimes tenants remembered things differently from the way Tobin did. A tenant would say she owed $150, and Tobin would say it was $250 or $600. Tobin once forgot that a tenant paid a year's worth of rent in advance after winning a workers' compensation claim. Trailer Park residents had a word for this, being, quote, Tobin, end quote. Most chalked this up to old age or forgetfulness, though Tobin was only forgetful in one direction. It took a certain skill to make a living off the city's poorest trailer park, a certain kind of initiative. Tobin's strategy was simple. He would walk right up to a drug addict or a metal scrapper or a disabled grandmother and say, quote, I want my money, end quote. He would pound on the door until a tenant answered. It was almost impossible to hide the fact that you were home. It was hard to hide much of anything. Office Susie knew when your check arrived. She put it in your mailbox. And Lenny could plainly see if you had enough money to buy cigarettes or beer or a new bike for your kid, but not enough to pay the rent. When the tenant opened the door, Tobin would thrust out his hand and say, quote, you got something for me? End quote. Sometimes he knocked for several minutes. Sometimes he walked around the trailer, slapping the aluminum siding. Sometimes he asked Lenny or another tenant to rap on the back door while he assailed the front. He called tenants at work, even talking to their supervisors. When caseworkers or ministers would call and say, quote, please, end quote, or, quote, wait just a minute, end quote, Tobin will reply, quote, pay me the rent, end quote. Tobin was not going to forgive and forget losing hundreds or thousands of dollars or settle for half of what he was owed or price a trailer below market value. When tenants fell behind, he had three options. He could let it slide and watch his income fall. He could begin eviction proceedings or he could start a conversation. Option one was a non-option. Tobin was a landlord to make a living and if he was too lenient, he could lose his business but Tobin also did not evict most tenants who owed him. Pushing tenants out and pulling new ones in cost money too. In an average month, 40 of Tobin's tenants were behind, nearly one-third of the trailer park. The average tenant owed $340, but Tobin only evicted a handful of tenants each month. A landlord could be too soft or too hard. The money was in the middle, with the third route, and his tenants were grateful for it though often not at first. Jerry Warren wasn't. Jerry used to ride with the Outlaws, a biker gang, and was covered in tattoos, several of which he had acquired in prison. Eviction notice in hand. Tobin had wrapped the side of Jerry's trailer, an aqua blue 700-footer Jerry had painted himself. Jerry bought up the notice and threw it in Tobin's face, yelling, quote, Tobin, I don't give a shit about this fucking eviction. And Lenny, I don't care how old you are. I'll still take to whooping your ass something good, end quote. Lenny and Jerry exchanged words, but Tobin was unfazed. He had begun a conversation, and a few days later, after he had cooled off, Jerry would pick it up. He offered to clean up the trailer park and attend to some maintenance concerns if Tobin canceled the eviction. Tobin accepted the offer. He took a different tack with Lorraine Jenkins. A month before the licenses committee had rejected Tobin's renewal application, he had given her a ride to eviction court in the Cadillac. 
Lorraine received SSI for learning impairments attributed to a childhood fall out of an attic window. Her monthly check was $714. Her monthly rent was $550, utilities not included. Lorraine had been late with the rent several times before Tobin finally took her to court. Quote, it's just hard to give up that rent, end quote, Lorraine admitted. Quote, you've got to wonder if the street people don't have the right idea. Just live on the street. Don't have to pay rent to nobody, end quote. She sat in the passenger seat while another tenant named Pam Rinky, a pregnant woman with straight cut bangs and freckles, sat in the back. In court, Tobin offered them both stipulation agreements, a civil court's version of a plea bargain. If they stuck to a tight payment schedule, Tobin would dismiss the eviction. If they deviated, Tobin could obtain a judgment of eviction and activate the sheriff's eviction squad with something called a, quote, writ of restitution, end quote, without having to take Lorraine or Pam to court again. Throughout his fight with Witowski, Tobin had worried that tenants would hold their money until the fate of the trailer park was settled. But most tenants went right on paying. Lorraine wasn't one of them. Already behind, she had withheld June's rent because she didn't know if the park would be shut down. If she had to move anyway, she figured, she might as well pocket the $550. Lorraine was pushing her luck. Besides owing back rent, she had been one of the critics who had appeared on the nightly news where she admitted to seeing prostitutes and drug dealers in the park. Quote, not quote, sorry, parentheses, but I usually don't acknowledge the parentheses. Audibly, I don't acknowledge it audibly. Uh, but okay. Phyllis Gladstone, the most vocal supporter of Witowski, had put Lorraine up to it. When Tobin found out about everything, he recalled that Lorraine hadn't fulfilled her stipulation agreement. That meant he could ask the sheriff's eviction squad to remove her. So he did. Soon, a letter from the Milwaukee Sheriff's Office arrived in Lorraine's mailbox. Printed on a bright yellow sheet of paper was the following message. Current occupant. You are hereby notified that the Milwaukee County Sheriff's Office has a court order, writ of restitution, assistance, requiring your immediate removal from the premises. Failure to vacate immediately will cause for the sheriff to remove your belongings from the premises. If any eviction is necessary, risk of damage or loss of property shall be borne by you, the defendant, after delivery by the sheriff to the place of safekeeping. Movers will not take food left in your refrigerator or freezer. Remove food items. The words had terrified Lorraine. It showed. Her emotions projected onto her face like a movie screen. When she was happy, she beamed, flashing a gap to smile. And when she was depressed, her whole face dropped as if being pulled down by a hundred tiny lead sinkers. At 54, Lorraine lived alone in a clean, white trailer, though she prayed to one day be reunited with her two adult daughters and her grandson, who, along with God, occupied the center of her universe. She was tubby-bellied, with a broad face and freckled white skin. Years ago, she had been gorgeous and liked to dress in a way that made boys lean out of their car windows. Lorraine still cared about her appearance and would leave her eyeglasses at home because she thought that made her look, quote, like a dead fish, end quote. When she wanted to look nice, she put on jewelry she had acquired as a young woman, using safety pins to expand the necklace chain so they fit. Smelling of sweat and vinegar, her brown hair in disarray, Lorraine stepped into the office, wringing the yellow paper like a dish rag. After a brisk, ex after a brisk exchange, Tobin led Lorraine outside and called after Susie. Quote, Susie, Susie, end quote. Tobin yelled, quote, what, Tobin, end quote, quote, take her to the bank, will you? She's going to get some money for the rent, end quote, quote, come on, end quote, Susie said, stepping briskly to her car. When Susie returned with Lorraine, Tobin was in the office, shuffling through papers, quote, how much, end quote, he asked Susie, quote, I have 400, end quote, Lorraine answered. Quote, I'm not calling off the eviction, end quote, Tobin said, still looking at Susie. Lorraine owed another $150 for that month. 
Lorraine just stood there. Tobin turned to Lorraine. Quote, when can you get me the other 150? End quote. Quote, tonight, okay? End quote. Tobin cut her off. Quote, okay, you give it to Susie or Lenny. End quote. Lorraine didn't have it. She had used $150 of her rent money to pay a defaulted utility bill with the hope of having her gas turned back on. She wanted to take a hot shower, scrub away the smell. She wanted to feel clean, maybe even something closer to pretty, like she used to feel when she danced on the tables for men back when her daughters were babies. She wanted the water to soothe the pain of her fibromyalgia, which she likened to, quote, a million knives, end quote, going up her back. She had prescriptions for Lacria and Celebrex, but didn't always have enough for the copay. Hot water would help, but $150 wasn't enough. We Energies accepted her money, but didn't turn on her gas. Lorraine felt stupid for pain. Susie made out a receipt on a piece of scrap paper and stapled it to Lorraine's eviction notice. Quote, you should go ask your sister for the rest, end quote, she suggested picking up the fax machine's phone and dialing a number she knew by heart. Quote, yes, hello? I need to stop an eviction at College Mobile Home Park, end quote, Susie said to the sheriff's office. Quote, for Lorraine Jenkins and W46, she took care of her rent, end quote. Office Susie had canceled the sheriff deputies, but Tobin could reactivate them if Lorraine didn't come up with the rest of what she owed. Lorraine sulked back to her trailer. It was so hot inside that she thought lukewarm water might run in the shower. She did turn on the fan. Fans made her dizzy. She didn't open a window. She just sat on the couch. She called a few local agencies. After several unsuccessful tries, she tried blankly to the floor. <clears throat> Excuse me. After several unsuccessful tries, she said blankly to the floor, quote, I can't think of anything else, end quote. Lorraine lay down on the couch, tried to ignore the heat, and slept. And then that brings us to the end of chapter three and the beginning of chapter four, which is entitled A Beautiful Collection. Okay, and I think what, what I take away from that last passage that we read is how Lorraine the story that Lorraine or the experience that Lorraine went through towards the end does a good job of illustrating what Matthew Desmond had talked about earlier in this chapter when he, or not early in this chapter, but earlier in this book, when he spoke about people having to choose between paying their utilities and, excuse me, sorry, yawned, uh, choosing between paying their utilities or paying their rent. And the idea that during the winter time, people would fall back or become late on their utilities or the electric bill because they knew it couldn't be shut off because of the gas bill, excuse me, because of the time of the year. And then when it was time when it could be shut off again, when it was no longer in the winter time, they had tried to short the rent to try to make up the back pay on these utilities. And so we see that play out in real time with Lorraine, where she sort of gets the the worst of both the worst of both worlds where she tries to take some of the rent money to pay the utilities the utilities were shut off so they didn't come back on because she didn't pay enough to get them back on so she lost out on that money and now she still is short for rent after getting an eviction notice we also see the uh sort of the 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 get some of the emotions that come with these things sometimes when we read these different pieces of information these different books sometimes it can be these stories can seem arbitrary i think it's it goes a long way when you can read and hear about this story taking place with or hear about these things happening to real people so that you can be reminded that behind these statistics behind this historical analysis this social commentary there are real people experiencing these things uh, okay so please share this on whatever platform you're listening to it on Remember, we put these episodes out on a daily basis to provide people the opportunity to begin or further their journey in the struggle to end police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice. And I'll holler at you tomorrow.